All right. I have 11 o'clock. I'd like to welcome you all to today's Badger Dairy Insight. My name is Heather Slusser, and I am the Dairy Educator for Marathon County. Badger Dairy Insight is a monthly webinar series providing the latest research-based dairy information to improve animal welfare, breeding and genetic selection, automation and modernization, and nutritional decisions for producers, dairy workers and managers, ag professionals, and educators. Today's speakers are Faith Reyes and Carolina Pinzon. Faith Reyes is from Northwest Wisconsin, where she earned her bachelor's degree in animal science from the University of Wisconsin, River Falls. She obtained her master's degree in animal science from Colorado State University and completed her PhD in dairy science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Prior to joining Extension, Faith conducted applied research in animal welfare and behavior, as well as gaining valuable industry experience while consulting in livestock handling, transport, and humane stunning. Carolina Pinzon holds a bachelor's degree in animal science from the National University of Columbia and a master's degree in dairy science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. With over 20 years of experience in the U.S. dairy industry, she has held various roles, including coordinating global training programs, providing bilingual training, and serving as an outreach specialist at Michigan State University. If you have any questions for Faith or Carolina along the way, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom, and we will make sure to answer them at the end of the presentation. At this point, Faith, Carolina, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Heather, for that introduction. Um, as she mentioned, I'm Faith Reyes, and today Carolina and I will be talking about ways to be utterly efficient. Um, also kind of stated as different management strategies that we can utilize for optimal performance and efficiency on a dairy farm. So first, um, Carolina and I um, are actually new to Extension as outreach specialists within the dairy team. And we're really excited to be able to continue to provide research-based information for the dairy industry to help address pressing challenges or provide different opportunities all with the over, overarching goal of being able to achieve economic viability, environmental sustainability, and production of that safe milk or meat. And Carolina and I are actually a part of a larger dairy team, so 12 of us in total. And so we just wanted to recognize everyone um, on our team. You may see a friendly face or two. We are actually spread throughout the entire state of Wisconsin. We like to kind of use the term, um, in general, we're located where the cows are. Uh, and so just a, a shout out, you may know uh, more of a regional educator here. You can see which counties they're associated with, as well as Carolina and I on um, a statewide level. So now we'll dive into the topic for today, with that being efficiency. And so in general, we can define the word efficiency as being able to achieve your results by using the resources you have in the best way possible. So perhaps when you think of the word efficiency, you might think of different ways you can um, increase um, energy savings or decrease power use. And those can definitely come into play on a dairy farm. Um, but there's also a couple other things we can consider uh, in terms of efficiency. One thing that always comes to mind is time, right? It never seems like there's just quite enough hours in the day to be able to check everything off the to-do list. Uh, and I know growing up, my father always said, if you're gonna walk to one end of the barn, you better bring whatever you need for your next task so you're not wasting any steps. So always trying to have that efficient, proactive mindset. And so when we're thinking about efficiency on the farm, today we'll actually talk about three different uh, themes. This is not by any means an all-inclusive list, but we'll be highlighting feed efficiency. So really thinking about the what we're being able to have an, as an input for the cow, so those feedstuffs, um, and what does that look like for an efficient output? So are we having an efficient conversion, especially knowing that feedstuffs are over half of our input costs for dairy farmers? 
And then we'll transfer to discussing being um, efficient in animal handling and how to facilitate that flow. And then finally, we'll also touch on efficiency in the milking parlor and associated with the milking process itself. So first, let's start with feed efficiency. So we can think of feed efficiency for the dairy cow as the pounds of milk produced over those pounds of dry matter feed consumed. So again, thinking about that output versus input type of conversion and is that happening in an efficient way? Another way we can think about a feed efficiency utilized as an estimate is known as residual feed intake or RFI. And so we can think about RFI as a way to understand how the energy is being utilized. So out of all the energy <clears throat> that we have, we know that some of that energy is shunted to milk energy seen here in blue. So having that energy to be able to produce the milk, uh, some of that energy is also utilized for maintenance, which we can see here as the black portion of the pie diagram. And then general, a little bit of energy is left for body reserves. Uh, so to be able to just keep those energy stores as needed. And so what's left over is known as this RFI component. And it allows us to utilize that as an estimate of feed efficiency. And so when we think about feed efficiency, there's often times where we can apply this to, well, can I group my cows in a way that helps to optimize this feed efficiency or improve it? And so one of the um, older um, mindsets that we've maybe heard about previously is if we have the capacity to or the feasibility, can we group those primiparous or first lactation animals separately from older cows or multiparous animals? And a recent study actually did perform this comparison. So they were able to um, be able to have primiparous or those first lactation animals interacting only with each other at the feed bunk. So this particular study did not involve separate pens, um, but able to control who they were able to compete with for feed at the feed bunk. And so then they also compared those first lactation only animals to what if a uh, older cow, a multi-parous animal, was only able to interact with those of her same parity. And then we took those two, those groups and compared it to is, is that different from when we mix the animals together? So those first lactation animals mixed with older cows. And when we did this, again, at the feed bunk, we found that the mixed parity group actually did tend to impact feed efficiency. We saw that as a result, there was an increased amount of competition at the feed bunk when these animals were mixed. And there was also changed feeding patterns with increased meal times. And this actually led to a tendency for decreased feed efficiency. So overall, the animals in the mixed parity group were actually less feed efficient. And so this um, brings up a key thing to keep in mind that if you have the feasibility to potentially have the first lactation animals separate, especially at the feed bunk, that could be a benefit here for efficiency. Next, one other thing to consider um, under the grouping strategies category would be in general, trying to reduce overstocking. And so we know that um, we sometimes have higher stocking densities in different pens. We can also consider overstocking at the level of the resting stall or the feed bunk. And so today what I'll be discussing is more so focused on the feed bunk. And we can see by the pictures on the left here that the top photo is a, what we would uh, call a 100% stocking density. So every cow has a place at the feed bunk and they can all eat at the same time. And as the photos go down to the middle and the bottom one, you can see that that density increases. So we have a higher stocking density, a lot more uh, traffic at the feed bunk, if you will. Uh, and we know that actually these higher stocking densities have led to changed feeding patterns. And we have also found that changed feeding patterns, specifically if cows are feeling as if they need to eat faster to consume their feed, this has led to reduced feed efficiency. And so there hasn't been um, a true research connection exactly to these higher stocking densities with a reduced feed efficiency, but I think it's something to just keep in mind and consider in the back of your, and in, in when you're considering grouping strategies of that these higher stocking densities can and do in fact change feeding patterns. And so this could be leading to a negative impact on feed efficiency. So keeping in mind that there may be acute um, or long-term impacts of overstocking. 
And so for this feed efficiency section in general, again, just to kind of give you some take home pieces of information, grouping strategies may impact feed efficiency. So being able to have those first lactation animals separate from older parity animals, especially at the feed bunk, and also if we can avoid overstocking. So next we'll transition into thinking about handling animals efficiently. So as we've heard um, a couple times lately, low stress, efficient animal handling is, is the goal here. So being able to handle cattle in a calm manner with no unnecessary loud noises or yelling and really striving to achieve that quiet environment that is able to utilize cattle natural behavior to facilitate flow. And so when we think about natural behavior of, a cow, of cows, there's a couple things that we can keep in mind. One of those is the flight zone, which I've outlined here in yellow. Um, and we can think of this, sometimes people call it the personal bubble of cows. And so if we are standing within this flight zone, the animal is usually motivated to move away. Um, whereas if you're standing outside of the flight zone, the animal may be alert to your presence, but not necessarily motivated to move away from you. And it's also a good thing to keep in mind that the size of the flight zone can vary depending on the individual or the type of setting that the cow may be in, whether it's a more close quarters or a larger pen area. And then complementary to the flight zone is also the point of balance. So I've circled that here in blue with a blue line extending into a, about the uh, shoulder portion of the cow. And so this the this can actually vary to the shoulder or all the way up to the ear of the individual, depending on the cow itself. And so we deem this the point of balance because if you're standing behind the point of balance towards the rear end of the animal and in the flight zone, the animal would move forward um, and again away from you. Whereas if you're in ahead of the point of balance, so closer to the animal's head and within the flight zone, the animal would move backwards. And so we can utilize these concepts to try to control movement and be able to uh, efficiently guide them to where uh, the goal is for that animal movement. The other concept to keep in mind is the blind spot. And so this is that shaded gray area here that you can see. And cattle, because their eyes are placed on the side of their head, can see um, a large distance almost all the way around them. But they do have this important blind spot to keep in mind. So when we're handling them, we want to ensure that you're not standing directly in it um, and you're always allowing the animals to be aware of your presence. Another natural behavior is a following behavior. So I'm sure many of us have seen cattle paths in the pasture or out in the cow yard. And so being a social herd animal, oftentimes animals are very willing to just follow each other in a single file line. This also flows quite well when we think of designing handling facilities. So something like this here um, with this curved chute takes advantage of the following behavior because animals will follow each other through the, the handling facility, but also it takes advantage of the animal's behavior to prefer to go back to where they came from. And so in a general sense, cows are a prey species. And so they find safety in going back to, in a similar direction to where they just were, because as long as the place they just were was safe, they would prefer to go back in that direction rather than to a new novel place that may not have um, as many safety components for them. So this red outline or this red line here outlines how the curved chute takes advantage of the animal thinking that they're going back to that same direction where they just came from. So the animal could flow through this and again circle through in an efficient way. And as mentioned, um, the all dairy cows and cattle in general are very visual in nature because of the fact that they are a prey species and because of the eyes being on the side of their head not only does this lend to a blind spot behind them, but it also leads to poor depth perception in front of them. So on the right side, this photograph is showing um, what we all know to be a very flat road surface, of course, with a white center line in the middle. Um, but to each of these heifers, 
it all looks like a different contrasting space between the white color and the black color. So their poor depth perception actually makes them think that maybe that white space is a hole they could fall into or just something scary that looks different. And so within this, each, which it's just actually from a video, each of these animals jump over that center line and would prefer not to step on it. And so it's something when we're considering about allowing times to or allowing cows time to inspect something that may have contrast, such as flooring changes or different colors, um, and just being aware that they do have this poor depth perception. Another thing that goes along with poor depth perception is the way they perceive environmental contrast. So one of those might be shadows in a handling facility. So these photos are actually of a small harvest facility, uh, the handling um, alleys before they go, would go into the building. And so this photo on the left is showing what we would consider soft shadows. So a lot of this area um, is uh, rather evenly lit with light. There's only a couple random bright spots off to the left side. And we would consider this as something that wouldn't have too much contrast for animals. And, but then the middle and the photo on the right show what we would consider to be sharp shadows. So you can see that majorities of the, the middle photo is darker with a bright contrasting sunbeam in the middle. And then the right photo has even more of those sunbeams. And so to a cow, this looks like a bright contrast. And I've even personally seen where animals will walk down an alley on the rubber flooring as long as it doesn't have a sunbeam and they will specifically avoid walking where the sun might filter through the side of the barn. And we actually know that um, during this type of setting that we're seeing in these photos, during the unloading event, cattle are actually more likely to balk or at least stop and stand still and stop their forward movement if these sharp shadows were present. And we also know that if cattle are balking, this could lead to handlers being able to um, use tail twisting or aversive handling. And so in a way to try to prevent uh, tail twisting or aversive handling and also prevent cattle balking, we can try to be aware of when some of these contrasts might occur, whether that includes thinking about the time of day we're handling animals through a facility, uh, where the sun filters through the side of a barn or through an open sided panel. Can we add solid sides so that light, or light can't filter through? Um, and thinking about ways that the animals may perceive the environment and try to prevent or minimize these contrasts. Another way to increase efficiency and be able to facilitate the flow when handling animals is to minimize distractions. So as mentioned before, trying to be aware of surroundings and removing any unnecessary items. So this could look like a yellow scraper um, that we see on the left photo here, just laying against a wall. So to us as people, it may seem normal, um, but to cows, especially the bright yellow color might be a little bit, um, I guess, frightening, um, or they might see that as a reason to put their head up and stop and look at it and stop the flow. And so if we're able to remove some of those items and have them not be in the line of sight for cattle, we can help to ensure that it's a more of efficient movement. Another item might be, of course, unnecessary trash, um, or even in this photo on the right, what seems like a normal hose to people, perhaps this fact that it's um, kind of a red bright color might be something that cattle would catch their eye and, and balk at. So can we place that hose in a different location that's still advantageous for people when we need to use it, but out of the line of sight for cattle? And also keeping in mind the different natural behavior aspects that we've just talked about, there's a maneuver called the walk back by that handlers can use to help to think of how can we make use of these natural behaviors. So oftentimes this maneuver is used when putting animals through a single file shoot, whether that's into a squeeze shoot, perhaps on a dairy, it could be looking like moving animals into a hoof trimming shoot. And the handler would actually start away from the cattle or away from um, that handling area and walk in a predict perpendicular direction, so directly towards the animals, but in front of them, so not directly at their head. And then keeping in mind where their flight zones might be and point of balances, the handler would then walk in the opposite direction past the cows so that the 
animal movement is then facilitated forward into the handling chute or trimming chute. And this triangle type pattern can then be repeated to keep moving cattle through in a single file line. So this can come in handy in things like the parlor as well. So thinking about animals loading into the parlor, walking from the holding area into the milking parlor, we can use this same method. So the person would walk directly perpendicular to where we want the cows to be able to walk into the parlor and then walk back against in the opposite direction, as you can see in the blue arrow, whereas then this would facilitate cow movement into the parlor so she can get set up for the milking process. Uh, and then as the handler even continues down farther into the parlor pit, we can see that this also helps to facilitate that following behavior where a second cow is starting to enter the parlor and continuing this triangle or mo motion in a repeated way will help facilitate the flow of cattle into the parlor. And so now just to get, again wrap up some take home messages for the animal handling section, if we can think about how to facilitate the low stress environment, that can really lend itself to more efficient animal handling. Um, being able to utilize the cattle's natural behavior to facilitate flow and really trying to assess the surroundings so that we're minimizing any distractions or contrasts that we can at least either minimize as much as possible or prevent in the design or setup period. So next, as I mentioned, something like the walk back by is advantageous in the parlor, but there's also other details of efficiency in the milking parlor that I will now allow Carolina to explain. Thank you, Faith. I'm here, but I cannot start my video because my host stopped it. So I appreciate if... Um... Can you see me now? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. So thank you, Faith. Uh, my name is Carolina Pinson, the Real Outreach Specialist. Uh, now we are going to continue with our topic of efficiency now with a little uh, focus on uh, milking, specifically how to make it a win for everyone involved. So our goal is clear. We want the milking process to be safe for our cows and our workers and of course beneficial for the dairy business, uh, meaning healthy cows producing high quality milk. So this might sound like a tightrope walk between time and quality, uh, but with proper training and intentional effort, uh, we can master this uh, balancing act. So in this part of our webinar, uh, we're going to emphasize uh, why or how calm handling of our animals is uh, critical. And I will share some strategies to optimize uh, workflow and ensuring our essential tasks during the milking are done both uh, correctly and on time. So uh, one of the factors influencing parlor efficiency is cow handling. So we understand that the release of oxytocin is uh, crucial for mil milk letdown and to have a fast and a complete milk. However, once an animal experiences uh, any negative uh, experience like fear or pain, it will take around 20 to 30 minutes uh, to calm a uh, cow uh, down. So what happens before the milking process or what happens before the cow going into the parlor really matters. Um, so we need to move the animals from the pen to the holding area into the parlor um, taking in consideration uh, cow's natural behavior that we just learned previously. So one important task of uh, our cow movers is going to be uh, to make sure the parlor never run out of cows. And the next pen of cows is in the holding area just as the last, cow, uh, last cows from my previous pens are finishing being milked. So um, important, uh, cow handlers uh, should walk, not run, uh, keep arms down, avoid yelling, avoid making loud noises, and use a uh, pressure to create this uh, flowing motion uh, without stopping the cows with their own uh, movement. 
Uh, also, it's uh, worth mentioning the importance of uh, well-designed facilities, including uh, good flooring and good lightning, um, um, because usually cows will be hesitant to move on slippery surfaces. Um, so during cold weather, very important to add some uh, lime or sand to ensure they have uh, quality footing as they enter or exit uh, the park. So in our holding area, um, we know that cows need to spend their day either um, laying down, because that's when they make milk, or eating or drinking or socializing. However, none of those activities can be done when they are in the holding area, right? Um, they are standing on concrete, away from feed, water, and stalls, and uh, it might even get a little bit uncomfortable uh, during uh, summer months. And I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is trying to put too many animals in the holding area. Um, so one uh, recommendation could be if you cannot fit all these animals, it's better to make two trips and avoid having even cows or people getting hurt um, during this process. So a couple of uh, recommendations here from the Dairyland Initiative um, is that our holding area should be um, sized to accommodate the largest group of cows that will be milked. Uh, the target area per cow in the holding area is 20 square feet per cow. And an increase of 125% in total area is recommended when following milking groups uh, must be brought in while the prior group is still being milked, right? So, and also we want to have a maximum 2% floor slope and uh, either uh, parallel grooves or rubber uh, flooring even, even better, more comfortable. So this picture is taken from the parlor uh, pit. It captures a scene where all the cows are facing the parlor. They appear calm. They are appear to be willing to enter on their own. If you notice, all their heads are positioned on a normal position, not neither up nor down. And uh, all their feet are firmly planted on the ground. And they do have ample space for them to stand and move comfortably. So for the sake of the cows and the sake of the people, it's not a good idea for people to come into the holding area. Like in, in reality, um, you should enter the holding area only at the end of a, of a milking group, at the end of a pen, for the last, uh, let's say, side of animals. Or if you are training like fresh animals, that's like the only time when people should come into the holding area. So another important piece is the mobile gate. Some people refer to that as the crowd gate, but I don't like that name. So your mobile gate, it should be there um, to guide cows gently into the milking parlor, to reduce empty space in the holding area, and to improve cow flow. And the idea is that you move this uh, mobile gate little and often. So nowadays, many uh, manufacturers, uh, they we use RFIDs and that automate the mobile gate uh, based on how many cows entry and exit the parlor. So that's a good uh, innovation to, to use these uh, mobile gates, um, improving efficiency and maybe reducing injuries. So in this, okay, well. In this next uh, slide, I have the don'ts of those mobile gates, right? So I have here in the picture, very crowded uh, holding area with all the cows like sideways. Uh, they don't look very comfortable at all. So like don't use them the, the mobile gate to push cows. That's impossible to push a cow with that uh, a mobile gate. Um, next one, uh, do never use that aggressively. So train your people, and one way to train them is from the milking parlor, you cannot see what's happening in the back, right? So have a little tour to the back of the holding area so they see what's happening and they understand like what, what they are causing. Another one is don't, do not force cows because that's a major a welfare concern. 
I am not a big fan of electrified uh, uh, crowd gates. Um, you know, like I think the your oxytocin release will be affected if you get shocked before coming into the parlor. And again, uh, don't train cows to get fetched. They have to learn how to come into the parlor by by their own. And we are in charge of making this uh, a positive experience for them in the parlor. So we already recognize the impact of cow handling on the parlor efficiency. Now I'm going to shift a little bit on the effect on, of uh, milking preparation on milking efficiency. So when cows enter to the parlor, they are relaxed. Uh, they have minimal defecation, no kicking. That's good for the people in the parlor pit, right? Um, then we have our milking technicians following the milking routine, ensuring cleanliness of teeth ends, allowing uh, for milk let down, etc. So we need a complete milking routine, uh, teeth, clean, teeth cleanliness, stimulation, and timely attachment. And we need to make sure our milking technicians are trained and in full compliance of, of this uh, milking routine. They have to be consistent in the in this context, meaning uh, same steps in the same order at the same pace for every cow during every milking, right? And for them to keep in mind the importance of uh, being on time and having this time efficiency. So before I keep going, I'm going to have a little review on our knowledge on other anatomy to understand why stimulation is important during our pre-milking uh, preparation. So the milk within the other can be divided into fractions, right? We have our cisternal milk that's shown in uh, green, and we have our alveo uh, that's around the 20% of the milk, and that's we have it with a passive availability, meaning that I just attach the unit and I can get that milk in the cisterns, good. And then I have my alveolar milk that that represents around 80% of my milk and that's fixed with capillary force. That means that stimulation is necessary. So physical stimulation, I need to induce an oxytocin release and then contracting all these myoepithelial cells uh, to shift the, the milk from the alveoli to the milk cistern and then I can extract it with my milking unit. So um, I'm not going to go very deep into the milking routine because that's not the focus today. Uh, of course, I know we need to have teeth disinfection. In this picture, I'm showing using a deep cap, using a foamer, using an automatic sprayer on a rotary parlor. Uh, the key is to have, of course, good coverage of every teeth and, uh, and enough killing time right? But none of these steps are going to help me with the stimulation, right? I'm not physically touching any of these uh, teeth in, in, on these pictures. So for real stimulation, I need to uh, be physically touching the teeth. So I have three pictures on the left, uh, uh, doing uh, forest stripping, so extracting the first milk uh, from the other. The second one is uh, wiping, a very strong wiping with a clean, dry towel. And the picture on the right is the use of an automatic scrubber. Also, the movement of those brushes are physical stimulation for the animals. So I'm going to need uh, something around uh, 12 to 16, sorry, 12 to 15 seconds of physical stimulation. So it could be a combination, right? My stripping and my wiping or my stripping and my, and my brush, right? And super important, we've heard before about our lag time. So just to remember this term, the lag time is the time from the start of my physical stimulation to milking unit attachment. And I want that period of time between a minute and a minute and a half, right? Even like two minutes is still acceptable, but not, not less or more than that. And all this, the importance of timing is because I want uh, to improve my milkability. So what's milkability? 
So milkability is when strong milk flow begins immediately after milking units are attached. So the cow milks out quickly, completely, and evenly with a very good and steady milk flow. So that's exactly what we see on this uh, short video on the right. The unit, the cow was very well stimulated. She was ready. The unit was attached. And immediately we see the milk flow inside the, co the milk collector. Uh, if we were in the parlor, we could hear the air bleeding into the claw air vent. And uh, suddenly at the end of the milking, it will slow down and the unit will be removed. So that's what we call a good milkability. So I'm gonna show here uh, uh, two graphics. So this is uh, from one study that was evaluating a stimulation and not stimulation on dairy cows. And um, in this graphic on the left, in this figure, I, it shows a milk flow with the black line and the claw vacuum with the red line, right? So on the left, I have the the milking, uh, sorry, the milk flow with the stimulation, right? So we can see that the unit is put on and milk flows immediately. It reaches peak flow quickly, and then it's maintained and then decreased rapidly, right? So that's what we want to see because uh, it's faster and it's efficient. So on the other hand, we have on the right side, um, a cow that was milked without a stimulation, right? So this figure uh, will show um, that the black line has a bimodal curve. So that bimodal curve is a milk flow curve that peaks and then drops back to no or low flow. And then the flow begins a second time, right? So the initial peak, so the little mountain at the beginning to the left, it represents the cisternal milk. So yes, that 20% of the milk I can, I can uh, harvest easy, but the 80% requires the presence of oxytocin. And what's happening here, it's that the, the this uh, stimulation is being done by the pulsation movement within the liner. So yeah, she will going to get uh, a stimulation, but uh, we'll see what are the, the, the cons or the negatives of not providing stimulation. So, um, okay, before I keep going, these uh, shaded um, areas are on, on both graphics are periods with high vacuum and low milk flow, right? And the problem with these periods is that they cause teeth irritation. We can see right away that we have larger periods of um, these uh, high vacuum in the animals without the stimulation. So um, to summarize, on the left, a cow with a stimulation and good black time, uh, we see more milk removed in the first two minutes. We have higher average milk flow and we have overall a shorter milking duration. On the other hand, we have a cow without stimulation. We have a delayed milk ejection. We have longer periods of high vacuum and low milk flow. And ideally, we want less than 5% of the animals in the herd to have this sort of bimodality uh, milking, bimodal milking. So what's the problem? What are the negative effects of lack of stimulation? So first, uh, regarding our milking efficiency, I'm going to have longer milkings um, because of uh, lack of stimulation. The other part is I'm gonna have teeth health issues uh, with all the consequences of like, uh, this uh, picture shows a uh, hyperkeratosis and it's caused for, because of low flow and high vacuum. And um, we'll have issues with, with, uh, issues with cleaning, uh, mastitis, et cetera. And one super important for all of us is like the economic part, right? Um, so this is a study from Michigan State University that uh, depending on the delay on milk let down, if either 30 seconds or 60 seconds, they'll have an average milk decrease per milking of between three and seven pounds. So um, that means 
that a cow who consistently has bimodal milking could be losing up to 21 pounds of production per day, right? So seven times three, 21. Okay, good. So now uh, let me talk about uh, uh, some important things in the parlor, some good strategies. Uh, this is a picture of a double 36 parallel parlor. Um, so we're going to start, if you want to be efficient, we're going to start with having all our supplies uh, ready, clean towels, full deep cups, teeth, uh, teeth plugs, uh, mountain dew, everything is ready uh, to start our milking. Uh, we have uh, the cows entering the parlor on their own. We need full cooperation. We need um, cows that um, are going to walk on their own. We don't want to have people here uh, throwing towels on cows' faces or making loud noises or people moving in front of the cows and stopping this, uh, this milk flow. Not milk flow, this cow flow. Uh, also, another key for efficient milking is to start prepping the cows as soon as we have two or three cows in place. Um, and uh, this can be a problem in parlors that wait to load the whole side before starting with the milking um, routine. So the person on the back, uh, this second person will focus on loading the rest of the cows using the technique we talked about before, the walk back by. And um, that will make, a, in this case, a parallel or a herringbone parlor like very efficient. The last one here, uh, I have a couple of take home message for this section. So some uh, strategies to optimize uh, milking efficiency. Um, one could be to, if cows struggle to come into the parlor, introduce cows to the parlor before calving. So like getting animals familiar with the parlor that will help them uh, get introduced to this new environment and definitely train workers on quiet, calm and stress-free handling. The other thing to eliminate distractions, uh, we talk about this for cows, like objects that don't belong into parlors or loud sounds, or even like people that it's, it's unaware of cows natural behavior. And also for people, it helps with efficiency, like removing distractions like cell phones, loud music, or unnecessary tasks during the milking routine. And lastly, establish good uh, practices related to use of a mobile gate and the indexing uh, gate and minimizing coming into the holding area. So overall, parlor efficiency requires team effort, right? So it's uh, between my, uh, my uh, workers, and management all working together towards these, towards these goals. Thank you, Carolina. So overall, just to kind of give some take home messages of both of our components of today's presentation, some things to consider would be that grouping strategies may um, improve feed efficiency. And so thinking about how we can group cows or reduce overstocking. And again, that critical part of about training um, all of our farm workforce on a safe and efficient cow handling is a very crucial piece to this. And then in the general sense, everything is a team effort. And so if we can uh, work together in a trained manner um, and a calm manner to be able to move animals, whether in the pens or in the parlor, this can help to facilitate a very efficiently run farm. And then one of those pieces to, oh, would you mind advancing the slide, Carolina? It doesn't seem to be yes. working. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, one of those important components is being able to put some of these principles into efficient action, if you will. And so there's many very neat training modules. And in fact, we, we heard about this last month, but just to give a another great shout out, uh, a Moving Cows serious video game is coming out of UW-Madison from Jennifer Van Oss's <laughs> lab. And so this allows us to be able to um, put animals in whoop, in a different setting, whether in the group pen to be able to practice handling animals or in the parlor area. And so it put some of those natural behaviors into practice in a video game setting and then take that out into real life.
And we would like to just recognize some great resources. Again, we have our UW-Madison Extension Dairy link here listed, as well as Dairyland Initiative, and of course, the Farm Program for great other training tools. And with that, um, we would just like to say thank you, and we will now take any questions. Perfect. Thank you both. Uh, we do actually have a couple of questions in the chat for you or in the Q&A. Um, so Carolina, I believe this one that these would be for you. So the question is, how can we assess the bimodality and over milking in the milking parlor using milk flow measurements? And it's a two part. So think about that one. And then the second part is, and what is the optimal milk flow in the first two minutes? Yes. So uh, by modality, if you have in your farm meters, so it's going to, uh, to it, it can provide a, a series of reports where you can see uh, what percentage of, of your farm has uh, by modality. So that's one option if you have uh, milk meters in place. Mm -hmm. If you don't, um, like visually, you can observe, like you can attach the unit and see the um, the milk flow right after attaching the unit and that has to be continuous if you are observing like many animals stopping milking and starting again it means that you're having bimodality so that's like a, a more like cow side way to observe if there is a bimodality the other question is what's the optimal milk in the first two minutes so usually we the goal is to have like 50 percent of your milk um, extracted in the first uh, two minutes of um, milking, 50% or more, right? Uh, extracted in the first uh, two uh, minutes, yes. And the next question I'm reading and I do not have the answer for that, so you know. Okay. So the next question is the optimal, va what is the optimal vacuum level in the parlor and at the teat level? And then how can we measure vacuum at the teat level? Yeah, the optimal vacuum level, it's going to depend on many things in the parlor. So it's hard to give you a, a hard number on that one because it's going to depend on like the your, the, your sizing, um, the length of your equipment, well, all that, and that which liners are you using? So it's hard to give like a number uh, for vacuum level. So I don't have the answer for that. All right. And, yes. Okay. Uh, if anyone out there has any other questions, please feel free to type them into the Q and A. Um, Faith did have a question for you on your animal handling and um, your zone and everything. So one thing that I had been taught, and you may have touched on this a little bit, but was that with cows, in order to get them to move, you could do like a zigzag pattern behind them or sometimes, you know, widening your arms to make yourself look bigger. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so I didn't touch on that too much today, but that's definitely one of the ways you can utilize, especially with the blind spot behind them, being able to zigzag in and out of the blind spot from side to side as you're trying to move them forward. It helps them um, keep known that you are there and you're pressuring them forward by entering their flight zone. So that's a, that's a great way. And I know um, using your arms helps you to kind of appear a little bit bigger, whether you're just trying to direct that movement uh, can be very helpful. Good points. Thank you. But maybe a quick note there is like open your arms, but don't like, don't wing it, right? Mm -hmm. Like don't do any sudden movements because that the, the cows don't like those sudden movements. Exactly. Awesome. All right. Well, I haven't seen anything new come in. Um, so Faith or Caroline, I'm not sure which one has the controls at this time, but if you could scroll forward to the next slide for me. Um, just real quick before we end today, I want to remind everybody that our next Badger Dairy Insight is January 16th, and we'll have uh, Dr. Kent Weigel with us. Dr. Weigel will present on current research on the day-to-day -day consistency of dry matter intake, milk yield, and the genetics behind it all. So we hope that you guys will join us. Uh, for general information about the dairy team, you can definitely look us up and find us on the web address on the next screen.
All right, so the Dairy Extension Program can be found at dairy.extension.wis.edu. Feel free to check it out and see what new articles and exciting videos we have out there for you all. So thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you, Carolina and Faith, for being with us and giving us such a stimulating presentation. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us.